Bless my heart. Again, as said, as said my name is Pastor Blackman, uh, pastor small congregation in Southeast Houston, Southwest Houston. Glad to be here. I want to say welcome again to our uh, other campuses, uh, Siena and uh, Cypress and the downtown campus and church online. So glad to be with you again. I want to say thanks to Pastor Greg and Zapson for having me here to share with you. It's wonderful congregation. You've been so generous and all those who hosted, it's been gracious. Let me just offer a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless my words. Father, I pray that the words I speak may be a life. Father, I just pray to the Lord that you would uh, give me consistency and consent. The Father, that you would bless the Father my words. May they hear all of you and none of me. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. In his book, Ruthless Truth, Brennan Manning tells the story of the great elitist John Kavanaugh, who took the opportunity to spend three months in the house of the dying in Calcutta, India. He was seeking in his own life to, that God would share with him how best to spend the rest of his life. The next morning he woke up and he met Mother Teresa and she asked him, how can I pray for you? And he said, I want, what can I do for you? He said, well, well, I want you to pray for me. And, and she said, what do you want me to pray for? And he says, I've traveled thousands of miles from the United States to get here, and I pray that you would pray that God would give me clarity. And she looked at him and says, I would not do that. And he says, why? She said, what you're clinging to is not what God, with the clarity you're clinging to is not what God want you from you. And he said to her, he says, I've always admired you from afar and it always seemed that you had clarity. And she laughed and said, no, I have not had clarity. What I've always had is trust. And I'm gonna pray that you trust in God. And that's what I want to speak for a few moments this morning. Walking by faith, trusting God. All of us in here have somehow, in once in our life, we always have clinged to clarity. We've clinged to this idea, if I can have a clear understanding what God wants from me, then I'll be all right. But walking by faith has nothing to do with clarity. It has all to do with trusting. In my own life, whenever I'm wanting to know God's next step for me in life, I would say to myself, God, it would be much easier, in my opinion, fantastic and awesome, if you just text me. <laughs> if you just email me and let me know the next step. But I discovered if he did that, then it would handicap me to trust in him. What God is seeking for all those who know him is this level of not of clarity, but of trust. Walking by faith and trusting God. You see, sometimes we fear the unknown because when we cling to clarity, it somehow prevents us from moving forward by faith. And I believe the scriptures is consistent in that thought. In Job chapter 13, verse 15, Job said this, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Psalms 34 and 8 reminds us, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is the man and the woman that trust in him. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, he says, blessed are those who minds are continually stayed upon him because they trust in him. God is not asking us to cling to more clarity, give us more clearness on what you want me to do. God is saying, I'm asking you to trust me. And when I look at that, I think of this idea that I want to give to you this morning, these, 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 five, these three expressions of faith accompanied with life faith principles that would help us in our walk with God that we can trust God for every movement of our lives. 
In Luke chapter 5 is our story for the morning, our text as well. Let me give you the story behind this story. Jesus has just finishing, or finished preaching to the crowd. He was by the lake of Gennesaret, and all of a sudden he was finished, I mean, preaching this large crowd because people were following him every way. And there was this group of fishermen who had just finished cleaning their nets, washing their boats. They had been fishing all night, and they have caught nothing. And so Jesus comes along after a pressing crowd of maybe 15,000 people pressing against him. He comes to this, this, this idea that, that I want to do something in someone's life, and he doesn't know it yet because it's Simon Peter. And he approaches Simon, who owns the boat, and he says, Simon, in verse 4, let's read it together. Here's what he says. When he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, lunch out into the deep. Everybody said, lunch out. Come on, do it louder. Lunch out. He says, Peter, I want you to lunch out to in the deep and let down your net for a catch. I like those words. See, here's the first life principle that you and I need to understand if we are to walk by faith and trust in God is this. Sometimes we have to, listen, go out of the shallow waters into the deep waters to learn more that we need to learn about God. Now, right there, if I was at my church, they'd have been shouting by now, saying, preach, pastor. Because that was a power. I spent a whole lot of time on that little point. <laughs> Listen, God is asking us that we need to move out of the shallow waters into the deeper waters so we will learn more about who God is. If you are in shallow waters, you are living a comfortable life. See, in shallow waters, you can touch the bottom. In shallow waters, there's insignificant, small, and insecure things. When you are delving in the shallow waters, what you're doing is you're having control. You can move in the shallow waters. When you are living in shallowness or the shallow waters, and especially if you are a Christian, you are living a careless, free Christian life. See, the shallow water is only reserved for the children. The children play in the shallow waters. And God is reminding us over and over again, if you're going to trust me, you have to move out from what's comfortable to you. I heard a preacher, a great, a great preacher by the name of Dr. Crawford Loritz. Uh, he pastors Fellowship Bible Church in uh, Rosewood, Georgia. He preached a sermon. It's powerful. He preached a sermon and says, and the title of the sermon was, Don't Drown in the Shallow Waters. Don't you like that? And Crawford tells the story about a friend, a pastor friend of his that was on the plane one day coming back home and God so happened by providence allowed him to sit next to Dr. Garden C. Taylor. Now, if you don't know him, look him up. He's the dean of preachers. He pastored Concord Baptist Church, uh, Church of Christ in Brooklyn, New York, going home to be with the Lord now. But he was 87 years old and this preacher had the opportunity to work it. I'm sitting beside Dr. Garden C. Taylor, the dean of preachers. What can I ask him? And he asked me one, he says, he says, Dr. Taylor, what are you afraid of? What is your greatest fear? And he says, two things. He responded, he says, first of all, my greatest fear is that all my mourners would die before me. <laughs> Nobody gonna cry when he died because they all be gone. And he says, the second thing is, he said, the second thing that I fear most is that God has given me all these great victories, all these great battles I've won. He's taken me over things. He's shown me uh, powerful things and movement in my life. And he says, the one thing that I fear, that I would do something foolish. I would drown in shallow waters. That I would get to the end of my life and I would mess up. I like the scripture and Psalm, Psalms 107, verse 35 and 35 says this, those who go down to the ship, who do business on the great waters, they see the miracles of God and they see his wonders in the deep. Listen, if you are standing in shallow waters and you can see your feet, that's not the place that God wants you. Thank you, brother. 
says, listen, I don't work in shallow waters. I work in the deep. If you want to follow me, you got to get out there. You got to get out of your comfort zone. You got to get out of your place of safety because out there, I am doing the work in the deep. When I study this passage, when you hear the Bible says, lunch out Peter in the deep and let down your net. In the deep, in New Testament theology, that word deep carries this idea that I want you to lunch out, listen, this Greek symbolism in Greek language, it means I want you to lunch out into the chaos. You see, in the deep there's chaos. In the deep there's frustration, there is fear, there's phobias, there is failures, there's fruitfulness. And God says, that's where I want you in the chaos. I thought about that. Have you noticed that God sometimes takes us in the chaos so we will be confronted with our own sins? We're scared of the chaos. But can also you understand this? In the chaos is where you experience transformation. God says, if you really want to see me work, lunch out into the deep. And he said that to Peter, lunch out. And then he says something else in the text, verse four. He says, not only lunch out, but let down your net for a catch. And listen, let me, let me just picture this for you because when we read this, we gloss over this, but you got to get in Peter's mind when he's hearing Jesus say this. And let me tell you, because he's being polite, but I'm going to tell you what he was thinking. I am a professional fisher. I, have, I know how to catch fish. You are a teacher, then teach. I know how to fish, let me fish. But what God was saying to Peter, a Simon, he was saying, listen, even though you understand fishermen, I'm going to put you in a position of your greatest knowledge and ask you to trust me. Now, here's my, here's my second life principle here, or here's my main principle of expression of faith. The first expression of faith that we all need if we're going to trust God and walk by faith is obedience. You have to obey. And that's what God is asking Peter to do. He's asking him to obey. And he said to Peter, lunch out, because sometimes God tells us to do things that we're uncomfortable with. He says, I want you to obey. And listen to what Jesus, Peter said in verse four. He says, master, we've worked hard all night and we have not caught anything. Now, let me stop there. It must have been very hard for Peter to make that statement. Any, any professional fishermen in here? You are not going to admit that you've been gone all day long and you come on with no fish. I tell you, it, it, for me, I'm stopping at the fish market. <laughs> There's no way that I'm going home to mama and say, listen, I've been gone all day and I didn't catch any fish. <laughs> no, no, I'm stopping and buying some fish. Okay? But God was saying to Peter, Simon, I want you to trust me. And here's what Simon said in that text. He says, I don't understand what you're doing, God, but I'm going to trust you. And here's what the words he said, five words, because you say so. Because you say so. I don't know. I don't understand what you're doing. And matter of fact, what you're asking me to do is simply ridiculous. I'm a fisherman. Fish are not going to be out in the deep at this time of day. They're only going to be in the shallow waters in the coolness of the night. And we've done that already. I finished my nets, I put up everything, and there is no fish out there to be caught. But because you say so. Here's the second life principle I want to give to you. Listen. Don't make the mistake. Don't make the mistake of limiting your obedience to, listen, to your understanding. Don't limit it. What I know or what I don't know is staggering, but what God's know and Jesus know is non-existent. When he tells me something, my response is, is don't obey. And that's what he's asking Peter here. He says, Peter, I want you to obey. Even though you have limited understanding of what I'm asking you to do, I want you to Obey. 
This is not a moment for Peter. This is not a moment of clarity for him. He's not asking God to clarify yourself. He's asking God or he's asking Peter, just have faith to trust me. When I think about this passage and I was looking at it the other day, the first thing came to mind is Peter says these words, Lord, help me to obey even when I don't understand. Have you ever been in there? Have God ever asked you to do something that didn't make any sense? And you sort of question that. You, God, you, you can't possibly be asking me to do that. No way. I know that that ain't going to work. And Peter is saying, God, please don't ask me to go somewhere where I just failed. Don't ask me to do that. I just finished. And we didn't catch anything. And then you're asking me to go out and do it again? Henry Melville writes in his book, Moby Dick, in a sermon that he was preaching to a room full of sur- uh, sailors. And he said, there will be time, there often will be time that God would ask you to do the hard things, the things that don't make any sense. And then he says something in, the, in one of the chapters. He said this. He said, if you're going to obey God, you have to disobey yourself. Wow, I like that. If you're going to obey God, you're going to have to disobey yourself. (laughs) Wow. It reminds me over and over again, if God, if I'm going to obey you, I have to disobey what I think. Don't, I have to tell myself, Garrett, do not limit, make sure I don't limit what you understand against what God is telling you to do. It's going to fail every time. Look what Peter says in verse six and seven. Watch this. I love this. Peter says in verse six, I mean, Proverbs, sorry, 35 and six says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will do what? He will make your play path straight. And that's why Peter responded in obedience Lord, if you say so, I'll do it. And in case you, under, in case you get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with understanding or getting an understanding. Here's the problem with that. The problem is that what matters is God understands. The only question that matters to us, will we trust his understanding? He already knows. Jesus says to Peter, here's what I want you to do is to obey me. And the first thing Peter did is he obeyed, even with his limited understanding. Verse six and seven, look what it says. And when they had done everything, they caught such a large number of fish that the fish began, the, the nets began to break. And they had to signal the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats and they began to sink. Can I tell you something? You don't have to know the whole story to turn the page to understand the story. God is asking me and he's asking you that sometimes God has to grow us in the areas of our greatest knowledge. And let me, let me just see, tell you this so, and share with you this. Listen, it is often in the smallest acts of obedience where the biggest blessings come from. The smallest acts of obedience is where the bigger blessings come from. Now, when we read verses six and seven, sometimes we just want to smooth over it, but let me just define it and then give you the second point. Here's the second expression of faith, not only obedience that we need, but we need humility. And we see humility in this passage because here's what it is. Even when we don't understand God completely, we have to obey him immediately. And Peter and Simon, what he did, when Simon gave up his boat, what happened is it opened up a whole do not dynamics to his life of obedience to God. When he trusted God in the opening, he said, God, I'm willing to, to give you my, my life and willing to give you my obedience. And God says, because you entrusted with me your boat, I'm going to open up a whole new dynamic in your life. And when they had went in that water and went out in the deep, and I can just imagine because you know Jesus can talk to fish, right? Y'all do know that. Come on now, y'all know that Jesus can talk to the fish. 
When he went into the village and he needed to pay taxes to Caesar, he told Peter, he says, listen, go down there in the lake and the first fish you catch, that's going to be a coin in this ball. Take it out and pay the taxes. So I believe that Jesus was telling the fish, not yet, not yet. <laughs> not yet. And Peter was out there and all of a sudden, Jesus says, get in the net. And they start pulling the nets and pulling the nets and the boats were full with fish and they were about to sink. Now watch, here's the humility part is. The Bible says, now watch, watch how the words change from verse four. He says, master, we've been out on the lake all night long. But when you get to verse eight, it changes. Simon Peter looked at him and said, Jesus fell on his knees and said, Jesus, go away from me. I'm a sinful man, oh Lord. You get it? It has now went from master teacher to Lord. What happened? Transformation. Humility. Can I paint the picture? See, because sometimes we move over that, we move over this verse and we miss the scene. Envision this boat 72 feet long and seven and a half feet wide, and all of a sudden it's full with fish flopping around, gasping for air. And guess where Peter is? He's on his knees, and fish are slapping him in the face. Now, can you see those fish slapping him in the face? They gasp for air. And Peter is on his knees. Can I tell you something? He is not paying attention to the fish. The fish is not the main story now. You know who it is? It is Jesus. This is the first time the word sinner is used in the book of Luke. He says, Lord, get away from me. I am a sinner. And he's saying to the Lord, he's bowing in humility and worship to God. The next verse said that they were astonished. All the people to see, they were astonished of his work. The word astonished in the Greek character idea is they had been a part of an extraordinary event, but not an extraordinary event. They had been in the presence of an ordinary, an extra person, and that was Jesus. He humbles himself. If you're gonna walk by faith, and I'm gonna walk by faith, trusting in God, there has to be Humility. Wow. It has to be. Without humility, we would get, not get to know who God is. And in the midst of this, something happens in Peter's life. And here's the third life principle. The third life principle is this. When you see Jesus clearly, you begin to see yourself clearly. When you begin to see yourself or Christ clearly, you begin to see Jesus clearly, but also you begin to, listen, obey him fully. And God does something in this small act of obedience with Peter. He takes him and gives him the smallest act of obedience and it turns into a huge blessing. That's why I say when we obey God in the small areas, for him, it was Peter, you in the shallow waters with your boat, and that's what you know to do is fish in shallow waters, but go 100 feet out. It is like you in a pool and you in the shallow water and going to the 10 feet. It doesn't take that long to do that. No effort. But the blessing comes out of that. And the blessing that God wants us to experience is he said, I want you to trust me. Listen, if you understand me clearly, you would do what I say and you would do it in humility. Here's another picture visual I had to get in my mind when I'm studying this text, because again, I, I, I'm, I'm fleshly like Peter, but Peter was transformed at that moment when he saw all those fish, and those fish wasn't attention, it was Jesus, because the first thing would have came in my mind, if I was a fisherman, the first thing I would have did is call my banker. <laughs> hey, I need, I need eight more boats. I would have went into an employment line and got more fishermen, bought new boats. I would have named my enterprise <laughs> Deep Sea Fishing. <laughs> that's my name. Because that's what we do, don't we? When God, when we, when the smallest obedience we give and we pray that God will show us the way and he shows us the way and we get big and blown up. Yeah. 
we start saying to God, thank you, I got it from here. Right? Peter says, no, it's humility. When you start making a name for yourself and you get beyond yourself, you say, Lord, I acted in obedience and now the Lord blessed me and you start calling everybody around to see your blessings and see what the Lord has done. Don't touch that. No, no, you can't touch it. You can't ride in it. No, you can't take your shoes off. You can't come. come. And God says, no. When God does a miracle in your life is the opportunity to be humble. Humility. And Peter recognized at that moment he was standing before the Lord. Yeah. Here's the last principle. Expression of faith. Obedience, humility, and lastly, surrender. Look at the text. So they pull, verse 11, so they pull their boats to the shore. <laughs> Look what they did. And they left everything. You get that? Now watch this. Stay with me. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Follow the nets. Not the Brooklyn nets. Follow the nets. They washed them. They let them down. They pulled them back up. They burst. And they left them. They left them. What? You know what the nets represented to Peter? Security. It's my business. It's my livelihood. It represents safety. Nets to him what meant who he was. That's his identity. I'm a fisherman. But the Bible says... They left everything. Wow. Walked away? Surrender? It's, I'm yours, Lord? That's what he says. That's what he was making the statement of. What is God asking you that you've been holding on and controlling that he's asking you to surrender? Huh? I thought about that in my own life. What are you holding on to? And he's saying to Peter, listen, because Peter recognized something that I need to recognize in my own life because all of us are trying to hold on, watch this, to our safety nets. Anybody got any safety nets? Your 401k, that's my safety net. My retirement, my house, my car, my children, my title, what is your safety net? God is saying, if he has blessed you, lay it down. Let it go. Some of us are holding on things that are pressing against us. We're, we're cynical and we're hard to get along with. We need, we need a hidey tidy at night. Y'all don't know what a hidey tidy is? Something, to, you know, a little something, something. Come on now. <laughs> Need something to get you some sleep, so get you some rest. God says the reason why you're anxious and cynical and hard to get along with is because you have not surrendered yet. We worry about things that don't even matter, hill of beans to God. And He's saying, give it up, surrender it. Some of you need to give up some toxic relationships that's holding you down, they're pulling you down, pulling you away from God. Follow it, lunch out. Let down and let go. If you're going to follow God in obedience and trust in him for every area of life, for health, for your children, for your, 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 your finance, whatever it is in life, he says, you're going to trust me, it starts with obedience. Even if it doesn't make any sense and even if you don't have all the information you're limited in understanding. He just says, trust me. And when he bless you and you see it, humble yourself. Because the Bible says he resisted the proud, right? And he caused them to be abased, to humble. 
And when you have humility, it spurns in our heart this act of surrender to God and him alone. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word today. I am convicted in my own spirit that you are the God that owns it all. And we are stewards over all and owners of nothing. And when we think we do own it to God, sometimes you remind us by crushing it. And Father, let my motto, let my mantra be, Father, daily, when I don't understand, may my words be as Simon said, because you said so. And that'll be enough for me. I don't have to understand it all. But because you said so, I'll listen and I'll obey. And God, it may be somebody here today that doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you're saying to them, let it go. Whatever you're holding on to, give it to me. And I'll give it back to you in a transformational way. When you see me clearly, you begin to see yourself clearly. So God, touch the heart that is listening in person here or those who are viewing online. May their hearts be changed to be like your heart. And that only happens, Father, through the, the person of the cross. Jesus, our Savior. And we can accept him by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. Added nothing. So if you hear and you can hear me, the Bible says if you can confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Christ from the dead, you can be transformed, you can be changed, you can be saved. And I pray that you would take that act of faith today, which is a gift from God. And I thank you, Father, for this word. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.